The DS difference, positive or negative? Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, delivering season previews. We're touching upon the contenders first. There's only a month until the season starts. I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it to all 70 Power 5 teams, let alone 130 in the FBS. Therefore, I'm going to hit the contenders. Make sure you've got season previews, in-depth analysis in your hands before uh, the season starts. So I've started in the ACC. You've seen Clemson and Florida State. We stop at Miami, 7-6, and 4-4 four and four last year in 2018. What is the trajectory for this program? Well, it's a team that over the past three prior seasons had gone 10-3, and 7-1 in the ACC in 2017. Of course, winning an elusive Coastal Division Championship, but falling flat in the ACC championship game, 35-3, to and losing to Wisconsin in the Orange Bowl. 9-4, and 5-3 and three in the ACC in Mark Rick's inaugural season, and then 8-5, 5-3 and five, five and three the previous season that included that uh, ousting of Al Golden after 58 nothing against Clemson. And then, to the players' credit, they rallied and delivered a 5-3 and three ACC finish and 8-5 and five overall with a bowl loss to Washington State. It adds up during those four years to 34 and 18, 21 and 11 in the ACC. The recruiting classes, let's look ahead to 2020. Right now, Miami ranks number eight in the country, number two in the ACC, according to the 247 composite. Uh, this 2019 class that will hit the field this fall, number four in the ACC, number 27 in the country. That, of course, after Rick left. And uh, the recruiting class went to shambles, and Manny Diaz was able to rally the efforts. In 2018, number two class in the ACC, number eight in all of college football, number two class in the ACC in 2017, so keep track. We've got Clemson and Florida State in the ACC. Therefore, Miami, for those two seasons in 2017 and 2018, under Mark Richt, actually out-recruited one of those two. They had the 12th rated recruiting class in the country in 2017. In 2016, number three in the ACC and number 22 in college football. So we're trying to give you a look at the trajectory of the program, but with a new coaching staff in place, whole new feel, whole new vibe. It's difficult to get a feel for it. The program was definitely headed slightly down, declining. Mark Richt took over and then it ascended. Certainly based on the talent uh, that came into the program under Mark Rick, those first two recruiting cycles, and then the division championship trip to the Orange Bowl 7-1 and one finish in the ACC. The trajectory was going up. Then 2018, it leveled off and then dipped and was slightly going down after the 7-5 and five regular season. All right, you got a feel based on the vibe, the feel for the program, the excitement, the energy that Manny Diaz hiring has brought that the trajectory is slightly on the incline because the recruiting looks really good, and that's what we're going to base it on because the season standings last year and the finish after starting at 5-1 and one would point to the decline. But you got to look at the coaching staff and the coaching change at the top. The, the, the field vibe and uh, the energy brought to the program, slight trajectory up in recruiting indications, but they hit the field against Florida, and then it's all going to – uh, be displayed on the field in wins and losses, and we'll get a better uh, gauge on it then. The offense starts at quarterback in the decision that Manny Diaz will make in selecting a quarterback. He has three inexperienced quarterbacks in Nikosi Perry, Jaron Williams, and Tate Martell. Perry's got the most experience playing about a half season. Actually, he ended up with more pass attempts than Malik Rozier last season. But he was marginal at 50%, 13 touchdowns, 6 picks. He showed some flashes, showed some good things. Uh, apparently, the arm strength is very close between Williams and Perry, much more over Martell. Uh, some of the knock against Martell, I believe, based on the reports that we've heard and based on the analysis that we receive here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, is that has been very much overstated. Tate Martell's a fine passer, not a great arm, but certainly a capable arm. So really it comes down to Miami's quarterback situation actually is in better shape in some ways than it's been in 15 years. 
because they've got three, four, and five-star players. So think about the probabilities here. As long as, as Manny Diaz and Dan Enos make the right selection, so you got three quarterbacks that have that kind of talent. You make the right selection, and then you develop that player. And, of course, that selection is going to come down to arm talent, running ability, grasping the offense, being a leader, being tough, uh, delivering in game situations, protecting the football is going to be important with a defensive-minded coach. So make the right decision, and the probabilities are that one of these three kids can play, if not two or three. And so then even if one falters or gets injured, God forbid, then you've got a second and third option. All right, the running game lost Travis Homer, basically a 1,000-yard back. He should not be missed much. Good player, but shouldn't be missed considering the talent awaiting in the wings that's already got a ton of experience in Cam Harris, who came on down the stretch and performed rather well uh, in um, some decent ACC games. Lorenzo Lingard, uh, his entry status uh, is still a bit up in the air, but uh, we're going to fall camp here very soon in Miami, meaning like right now. And uh, he, of course, the five-star, and Cam Harris shouldn't get disregarded. So sometimes when a player is like ranked one or two in the country and somebody else is like number eight, they're treated like chopped liver. But Cam Harris is an exceptional player, and he showed that at the back end of 2018. And, of course, DJ Dallas. He's had a few fumbling issues, but he's a capable back and, and really a bulldozer when he gets him uh, ahead of steam. Going So Miami set at running back. They're a little thin, but they're set. They've got three guys that you would think should be able to tack on quite a few carries. All right, at wide receiver, Jeff Thomas, is he a true number one? We know he's a deep threat, a very talented kid, but maybe not a true number one. K.J. Osborne comes in from Buffalo, where he caught 53 passes last year and seven touchdowns. Is he a number one? We've heard good things about K.J. Osborne. I can't say that I've really seen him play. I've watched Buffalo play, but didn't necessarily key on K.J. Osborne, not understanding that he was going to one day be a Miami Hurricane and play uh, more meaningful games in the Power Five. Miami's loaded at wide receiver beyond these guys. Brevin Jordan caught 32 passes last year. Mike Harley hauled in 21. They've got even more beyond that. Uh, you Miami fans that watch us on a regular basis know that our analysis is is everywhere. It runs deep. It runs wild. So check out all the videos. Uh, this is just a season preview, hitting the high notes of the positions. And really, I want to grind down and emphasize the trajectory of the program and some of the advanced metrics. Offensive line has been a mess and has been a weak link for quite some time. Uh, two starters are lost. The two most experienced starters, Navon Donaldson comes back. Uh, he's the best offensive lineman. And uh, I don't know that it really matters that they lose their two most experienced offensive linemen because the offensive line, again, has been a, a weak link. Zion Nelson, maybe he becomes a star. He was lightly regarded coming out of high school, but he's played the best, at least uh, based on the reports coming out of spring camp. The offensive line has been a weak link, but over the last few years, because of the stagnant offensive type play calling, the predictability, that makes it very difficult on offensive linemen when guys on the defensive side know where the ball's going and shoot gaps. So maybe the offensive line's not quite as bad as we thought. This offense was 100th in the nation in havoc rate. That's awful. Bottom 25 to 30 in the nation, meaning that they're allowing way too many havoc, disruptive type plays. Batted down passes, pass breakups, tackles for loss, and sacks. They were 103rd in third down distance, meaning a ton of incomplete passes because the completion percentage out of Rozier and Perry was awful, just a little over 50%. So a lot of incomplete passes on first and second down and a lot of stuffs on the run game on first and second down. So the run game, the overall stats look decent from 2018, but a lot of explosive big plays countered the... Uh, inordinate amount of stuffs behind the line of scrimmage. So the offense has to be much more consistent. They relied on big plays way too much last year and still were ineffective. The defense, on the other hand, 
The defense's havoc rate was number one in the nation, causing disruptive plays. But they lose Joe Jackson. They lose Gerald Willis as well, two of the better off uh, defensive linemen in the country. But still extremely talented. Uh, Sean pa- uh, Scott Patchen, uh, the transfer portal was used to get uh, Trayvon Hill. He's in the fold. The linebacking unit, uh, there was a recent video and discussion in which I likened it to what we saw in the 1970s steel curtain with the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers defense, Jack Lambert, Jack Ham, Andy Russell, the original outside linebacker. Then later it was uh, Robin Cole and Dirt Winston. Those guys played together for 10 years. In the NFL, that's an eternity. Uh, more recently with the New Orleans Saints, Pat Swilling, Ricky Jackson, uh, Sam Mills, all playing together for a long, long time. This is what it seems like with Miami. Since when do you have three and, to a certain extent, four guys playing together for this long? From their freshman year through their senior year, they want to accomplish something this year. So these guys have been stellar their entire careers, especially Shaq Quarterman, but expect them to especially be committed to winning uh, this last go-around. Shaq Quarterman, Michael Pinkney, Zach McLeod, and you can throw in Romeo Finley. Uh, The defensive secondary played extremely well, but they lost three starters. Uh, Number one corner Trajan Bandy is back. We're talking about the number one passer raider rating defense, rating defense in the nation. Uh, They were exceptional against the pass. USC transfer Bubba Bolden could prove to be huge. He's a big talent, big time player, and... He may infuse life into this defense and into the secondary, and with three starters lost, could be exactly what they need. Uh, the talent there is immense with Bubba Bolden. He was highly thought of coming out of high school, suspended for 2018. The advanced stats uh, that we've picked up from Athlons and from SB Nation uh, tell us that the special teams were awful in regards to field position given up. Uh, not many returns. And the punting atrocious, one of the worst punting uh, displays in the nation. Bubba Baxa was 9 for 12. He was decent. Uh, Lewis Headley comes in. Uh, This guy will definitely win any any weightlifting contest with any punter in the nation. So when the kick returners get into the open field and see the punter in their way, They either think, hey, I can run through this guy or just make him look plain silly in the open field. With Headley, they may be able to do that, but they don't want to try to run over this guy. Uh, He's all tatted up, and he is a monster. He's got some guns, and he can apparently punt, and that's what they needed last season. The schedule is not daunting. Florida in week one, roughly one of the top 10 or 15 teams in the nation. The rest of the non-conference is a cakewalk. Uh, with the likes of Bethune Cookman and FIU, et cetera. But, of course, the Florida State game on the other division. So the division situation is Miami always plays Florida State, which they should, and they play Louisville. So they play the worst team projected in the ACC, and they play Florida State. So it's a light touch in the ACC with Louisville and Florida State, unless the Knolls really bounce back. And they do have to go to Tallahassee for that game in November. And then it's a bunch of teams in the ACC Coastal Division in which Miami holds the talent edge. But in recent years, who's won the division besides 2017? All the other teams in the division. So do not discount the Virginias and Virginia Techs of the world in particular. Uh, Possibly Duke plays into the mix as well. But I'm looking mostly at Virginia, Virginia Tech as being the main Uh, challenges to Miami winning the Coastal Division. We will be back with more previews. And yes, you will get a prediction out of us. Believe me, we are going to have a prediction extravaganza before the season starts. I will unveil all my predictions. And uh, you will know exactly where we stand for the 2019 season right here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Please like, comment, share the videos, and subscribe.